with our active shooter class that we had just recently, a presentation. And so he's here today to do situational awareness. I think we will gain a lot of information from him. And so uh, if y'all are ready, we're going to get started. Awesome, awesome. Is, are you guys all the security team? I use the term guys as you know. Yeah. Is a group of no. individuals. Uh, I want to I'll assume your gender is. Yes, <laughs> so is everybody on the security team for the most part? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. It was open to others, but not to the system. <laughs> Alright, so now that I'm being recorded, I guess I can't say all true jokes or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Everything will be seen here, I promise. <laughs> um, for those that do not know me, I am Officer Church, Mesquite Police Department. I've been a police officer here in Mesquite for the last 14 years. Uh, I'm not originally from here, I'm from South Texas, uh, Cote, Texas, to be exact, strawberry capital. Cote, Cote, yeah. My great grandfather was a strawberry farmer. Uh, my grandfather was an alcoholic. My dad didn't want to be either one, so here we are in Mesquite. <laughs> 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 not too bad, not too bad. So a lot of what I do for the police department is presentations such as this. Um, my partner and I started to kind of dabble in the CRACI, which is Civilian Response to Active Shooter Events, and we had that last time here with um, with the Officer Quinn, who was uh, who was a, kind of the head of the TAC team at that point, um, currently. Um, so what we want to do with the police department is establish some type of just rules for churches in general because if you think about it the two things that we have a ton of here in the city of mesquite are dollar stores and churches you know so we want to take care of at least one of those <laughs> that being our churches i yeah, mean the churches assuming <laughs> Um, so we want to develop some type of standard response protocol for not only your church but all the churches that we have here in the city of mesquite and hopefully that will kind of trailblaze onto other um, cities that have a uh, large amount of churches as well. <coughs> so this is just kind of one of those, and this is situational awareness. Um, the bottom quote I think is pretty awesome is that awareness is the currency with which you purchase time to act. You know, it's just small little everyday tweaks that you make to your life, and and hopefully that in time they'll just become, you know, second nature. For example, uh, being a police officer. Um, prior to being in law enforcement, and when I go into a restaurant, I just sit anywhere. I do whatever I want, right? But now in law enforcement, I find myself, and even subconsciously doing this, is sitting with my back against the door. You know? and I'm just kind of weird how I'm standing here now so I can see, you know, all the, the doors, for the most part, that are open and that can be open. So, same thing as, I don't expect you guys to be Jason Bourne or anything like that, but I definitely want you just to keep you know, an eye on things for your safety, especially around the holidays now that they're approaching pretty soon. You know, think about this. Um, does anybody know what's happening around 8 o'clock? Cowboys been losing. Do y'all have church later today? Church what? Church later today? An afternoon church or anything like that? Oh, they have that prayer meeting. prayer meeting at 5. What time does that usually let out? Six or seven. Six or seven. Good. Because, you know, later on today we're expecting some rain, you know, so, you know, situational awareness can be something as simple as packing an umbrella. You know, that's, I want to give it to you in that aspect, is that it can be something as preparing for an active shooter event to simply lifting up your head and looking at a parking lot to bring an umbrella to an event where you suspect rain. You know, it's, it's that simple and it's that dynamic. It's the ability to process, comprehend information about how to survive an emergency situation. More simply, it's knowing what's going on around you. It's dynamic, hard to maintain, and easy to lose because we get so caught up in doing this number right here that we forget sometimes to look up and see what's around us, right? And I'm guilty of this. I'll, I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you I was sitting in my squad car yesterday right, at the red light, and I was doing this. <laughs> And I heard a honk next door, and it was a buddy of mine um, that was just saying hi to me. You know, not a police officer, but just somebody I knew in the neighborhood. And and I was so captivated by my cell phone that I didn't even. I mean, how easy would it have been for him to just, if that was my buddy, for somebody that wanted to do me harm, right? And I was in a cop car of all places. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I don't wear a bulletproof vest on my head. So, but that's the thing. It's it's hard to maintain. It's easy to lose because. 
we, we live our everyday lives. You know, we, we don't focus on, you know, hey, let me get my keys out and have them ready for when I go to my car or I go to my door and open the door. You know? so we fumble with our giant purses, right, or our pockets, or you know, we have a million things in there, we gotta look around for it. It's, it's, it's just simple little things like that. That's, that's what I stress about situational awareness. So here I have a couple of tips and tricks to kind of assist you with situational awareness. You might notice who this handsome fella is right there on that picture. <laughs> Just don't make Cal mad. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for him to take a look. That's him <laughs> yesterday. He was, uh, he was preparing for some situational awareness. <laughs> Did he tell you guys what that is or what he's doing? He, he, he's, the, he's actually the oldest police recruit that we have here. Uh oh. <laughs> he's actually going to be dual certified. He's going to be police and firefighter. So he'll be doing sleep most of the time. So. <laughs> or playing games. Or, or playing games. Yeah. No, but we have our Citizens Police Academy. And yesterday we took him out for a rain day and, and got to shoot a little bit. And so there he is cooking off a couple rounds on a, on a semi automatic and automatic weapon. Why do you have him surrounded? <laughs> I plead the fit. <laughs> All right, so here are 10 ways to kind of improve your situational awareness. But I want to give you a little guidance and a color chart here. Hopefully, you can kind of see. But these are the states or the alert levels that hopefully um, we stay at and don't ever go into. So, for example, when we say either going into the black or going into the white, you know, the white is unaware. You're tuned out. You don't care about anything going on. You're not aware of your surroundings. You don't know what's going on, anything whatsoever. You're just in the way. Okay. Um, this is what I'm doing when I am off duty, relaxed awareness, just paying attention but enjoying life. And that's where I want everybody to be. That's, that's where you should be living your life. You, you, you do small things and tweaks to make take care of your safety and security, but you're still enjoying life. You're not on high light, you're not walking around like this. You know, you, you are just aware, you have your head on a swivel. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, but just looking around, make sure everything's okay, but you're still enjoying your everyday life. We, now, used, we used to have a yellow dot on our watches, you know, but we're not training. Mm -hmm. And it was for that reason, you know, that we just alert, exactly. you know, and ready to go. Exactly. Now, at any time, if you guys have questions, comments, please feel free. I want this to be an open area so we can all talk, cuss and discuss, minus the cussing, because, you know, I'm going out the <laughs> door. Um, but just, you know, if you guys have any thoughts, ideas, comments, you're more than welcome to, to say those. Um, focus awareness, carefully observing any poten or a potential danger, and that's in the orange right there. And that's how usually I am when I'm patrolling the streets or wearing this uniform. I am, you know, I never want to be in the white, especially in this uniform. Um, just focus awareness, you know, knowing that there could be a potential threat. Uh, high alert, confirmed threat, need to take action. Right, that is when we're going to make contact with the a suspect, or you know, we, we've noticed that you, you tell a lot by by hands and body movements. You know, now if somebody's you know getting kind of stretched out and popping their knuckles. Everybody already knows what that is. Does that mean I'm here to give you a high five? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely not. So <clears throat> just high alert, confirmed threat. You can take action. Right? That's the red. And then going into the black is. When we are so shocked about something happening that we cannot comprehend what's going on, and then it automatically hits that fight or flight um, inside of our body. So, you know, we're going to do one of those things either fight, flight, right? or freeze. Right? Um, so, that's coming to us. Let me tell you a little bit about the situation awareness in the story. Um, when I first got onto the streets, I'd never seen a dead body before until I became a police officer. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, my aunt used to work at this little diner, and she said, hey, I have a friend named Willard. I haven't seen him in a while. Do you mind checking on him? Said, yeah, sure, you know, I don't, I don't mind. Um, but she left a couple things out. One is Willard was a, a horrible, horrible alcoholic, and he had, he had health problems, right? She hadn't seen him in a week or so, um, so she started to get worried. It was in the middle of August. You know, we had those highs around, you know, 100 and something degrees. And so as I got there, there was a neighbor in the parking lot, uh, and the neighbor next door was outside, and I, and I asked him, I was like, hey, you know, have you seen your neighbor here? Do you talk to your neighbor? He's like, oh, yeah, Willard. I haven't seen him in a while. His truck's out there. Um, 
but I, you know, I haven't I haven't seen him in a week or so, and so I was like, well, you know, my aunt sent me over here to kind of check on him to make sure he's all right, and so he's like, you know, I actually have a key. You know, we've known each other for. I, I don't want to tell you this disgusting story as you're eating lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, but uh, he gets the key and. And he's like, you know, I'll go in and check on him. And I was like, yeah, you're more than welcome to. Because as I was walking in, I saw that there were flies on the windowsill. You know, in police work, we call that a clue. Well, that's true. <laughs> and, so, and so he said he's going to go in first. And then I saw those flies. Like, By all means, you're, go ahead, my man. I'll wait right here for you. Well, as soon as you open that door, think about it. It's been a week. He's a horrible, horrible alcoholic, and um, the AC didn't work. The power was off, so it smelled like heaven in there. Obviously. So he went in there, and he comes out, and he said, "Willard is as black as your shirt." And I was like, "What does that? What does that mean?" Because um, obviously I wasn't aware of what was going on. About uh, hadn't versed myself in, in, uh, in how a body changes, right? Once it's been in that kind of position, so you know, obviously the smell hits you really badly. You go in there, and then you just see this man that at one point in time was 180 pounds, but is now 300 pounds, black skin, but not because he was natural American, but because um, his body just started to decompose, and he was a white, he was a white individual. But you know the juices and being that hot temperature, and I loaded, yes. And he was—he looked like he was ready to pop. I mean, he was seconds are available. <laughs> well, I—I I, I originally thought that he committed suicide because his arm was hanging off the bed and it had burst open. You know, because obviously gravity and those liquids are going to have to go somewhere so they roll on the floor. Well, we called the medical examiner out to get this this. You know, another thing too was alcoholic, so you know all that alcohol was in his system. So good rule. All right? If you're gonna pass away, make sure you don't do it alone. Make sure there's somebody there, <laughs> not leave you there for a week, and then make sure you feed your animals. All right? <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. So we call the medical examiner out, and he comes out. But they say, yeah, we'll send somebody. They send. Two girls that were about thirty pounds each. Yep. And it was, <laughs> it yeah, but they've been there a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I worked with them. And, uh, and about this time it's dark, like so they're like really So they, these two girls are trying to move this giant three hundred pound balloon in essence filled with liquid. And they're like, "Officer, oh, can you help them?" I, I, I cannot help. I, I can hold my flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we got we got him on there and, and got it all squared away. But just, you know, I wasn't prepared for that event. You know, one thing, you know, you, you want to think of maybe a mask, especially with that smell. I had to throw my uniform in the trash. You know, this because it smells so bad. You know, we don't have these fancy washers like the fire. Oh! <laughs> let's see how many. Let's see how many digs. I can <laughs> I'm just kidding. But another story on situational awareness of of children. You know, children don't have good, um, they will sometimes pipe off with the craziest things. Let me give you a little PG story. Um, my children, I took them to an indoor water park um, in, in you know, July or so this past year. And, and in this water park is like a little lazy river and there's all these tubes where the kids can go down the water and whatnot. And so back in the day I used to take my son and I would go down with him. Well now, this year we go and you know, he, he has to get measured by the lifeguard. So the lifeguard takes him over there and he's like, yep, you're 48 inches. You're tall enough to ride. So my son's excited. He's super happy. He's ready to go. And, um, and so he shoots down all day, right, all by himself. He doesn't need his daddy anymore. So he's going down the wire sl slide. And then, you know, I always teach my kids, like, no, you don't want to use the restroom in the pool. Raise your hand and use your restroom in the pool. I tell them, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do those things. So I take them to the restroom. So there's three urinals here, one in the middle and then two on the side. I use this one. My son takes the middle one because the other one will occupy it. So as we're using the restroom, my son looks over at this random man and he goes, I'm 48 inches. <laughs> And my dad had been, and then that guy next door goes, well, you guys all be. <laughs> so, 
always be aware for that ever-changing environment. That's why we need to learn to predict events, right? Learn to predict events. <laughs> Who would have knew that my son was gonna pipe off with something like that? But he was just so excited that he was 48 years old. <laughs> 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 The most effective aspect involves the ability to project future actions of elements around you. Like today, you know, like I said, later on today it's going to rain. It could be something as simple as it's going to rain today, watching forecast, right? It doesn't, there's nothing wrong with pulling out your phone that morning before you head out for the day and say, oh, you know what, the temperature is. You know what, as technology is increasing, like I'm sure a lot of you guys can say, hey Siri, hey Alexa, hey whatever is going on. Yeah. <laughs> So we can say, you know, what's the temperature, or hey, can you give me the weather, and then they'll give you that. And that's, in essence, we're predicting our events. We're going to find out what the weather is and what the temperature is outside, or if it's going to rain or anything's going on. You know, hey, what's the news sometimes, right? We use technology now to predict events, like, hey, if it's going to be cold outside, you want to you bundle up, right? Or it's going to be raining, you, you want to take... Um, an umbrella. And that's the very simple level of predicting this. Um, another thing is playing what if games with yourself. You know, do you ever sit in church? And obviously, the pastor has a wonderful sermon that he's. But you know, sometimes you just kind of drift off in the nowhere land for a little while. Um, have you ever played a what if game with yourself? You're sitting there in that pew. You know, let's say you're like the fire department, might sit very back in the church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what if some of that were to come in that was deranged? Not necessarily having a gun or anything, but just. Something was off about him. You know, he came in saying that he was Jesus Christ and he'd go to the front of the church and start preaching the word of the Lord. It's not necessarily anything that you'd have to be worried about as far as him maybe shooting up the place, but it should be concerning, right, that some guys think that he's Jesus Christ and going to come up and preach. And we want to obviously get that individual away from the congregation if you're separated from the security team and talk to them more, call the police department out if you need assistance, right? This man could then, you know, get agitated. No, I'm sorry, you're not going to go up to the front and preach. He gets angry, starts wanting to push and shove and fight. And what would you do in that situation? How would you as a group collectively do in that situation? Right? I pray to God that never happens, but we have to learn to predict events. What if there's a fire? What would we do? Or even something as simple as, let's say right now, we're having this incident right here, and somebody comes in here with a gun. What are we going to do? Absolutely. Well, I would hope that everybody go this way, and I would go this way. That's what we, we predict what happens. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so even something as simple as predicting the weather, you know, taking that step to, hey, I want to educate myself on what the weather's going to be like to be able to to deal with that situation, or. Um, an active shooter event. I mean, think about the folks in Katrina, you know, or even in Harvey. You know, say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna wait it out. Mm -hmm. And then come to find out that the helicopters having to come <coughs> rescue them because they didn't learn to predict the events. Right. You gotta, <clears throat> you know, you talked about planning on predicting events, and just like you know, y'all go through different training evolutions based on past events mm -hmm. because. We're a reactionary society, and a lot of times we don't learn to prepare for something until it's already happened. Uh, just like fire department, we do the same thing. So, <clears throat> besides the shooter event, but like I said, I didn't think about somebody just not necessarily being a a shooting potential, or at least not initially. Uh, is there a unfortunately is there a list of the most common? <coughs> events to prepare for in a church besides shooter? But that's the thing, that every single church is completely different. Take this for an example. You guys, every day, I drive by this church every single day, and every day <coughs> there are like 10 to 15 kids out there playing basketball. All right? Let's say one of those kids get into an argument with each other and they produce a gun. They're not necessarily trying to shoot here, right? but it happens out there. You know, And you say you're having church. What, what you were so just like, think about this for an example, too. We had an incident at Terry Middle School where there was supposedly a kid with a gun, right? Well, the crazy thing about that is that in a couple of weeks, we were supposed to have a huge citywide uh, MISD 
fire department kind of drill line, just similar to that, and it, and, it, and, it, and it happened in real time. So, you know, instead of actually training, that was a training exercise. And, and the good thing is we all found out that, um, one, the, the, it, it rains police and fire, all right? If there's an incident, it will rain police and fire. And, and two, that the investigators need to put some lights on their vehicles because we were hit, we were almost colliding with each other because we were driving, uh, you know, zero to 100 miles an hour to get here at the school. So the good thing is we're predicting, hey, if this happens, uh, here's how we would act. You know, so, so do that with your everyday life. After you've been able to identify elements in your environment and comprehend the situation, it's time to take it up one step further. Uh, use this information to think ahead and determine how it will affect future actions and events in the environment. So that can be every day from here at church to your job to work. There's a funny clip of The Office. I don't know if you guys have ever seen The Office. But Dwight was, there's one episode where he wanted people to be aware of fire drills, right? That they did not take them serious, nobody cared. <laughs> have you guys seen that? So what he does is he blocks all the doors, right? He puts wedges in the doors. He heats up all the door handles, right? <laughs> <laughs> he, he locks all the doors and secures everything, and then he throws a, a trash can full of paper. Uh, he catches on fire, right? And so it is just mass chaos because nobody took it serious, right? Until Dwight did something. Obviously, I don't want you guys to do that. Don't let <laughs> trash can here at church on fire and see what people do. But you know, <laughs> learn to predict your events. Any questions about that before I move on? <clears throat> All right. Identify elements around you. So the first step in achieving situational awareness is to become aware of the important elements in your environment. All right. For example, um, who would you assume has a gun here in the church? Or can you even carry a gun? Do you guys make that clear yet? Yes. Yes? The, those that have a... <clears throat> that concealed handgun permit. But they're not to be exposed. Okay, okay. So it's not an open carry kind of concept. Right. Okay. All, right. All right, so at that, so identifying is who would we suspect in here has a gun? Now, don't raise your hand, but who would you think would have a gun? Would you think he has one? Would you think he has one? She has a bazooka. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> so if something bad would have happened, I'm going to straight here. You know? But but think about that. You know? Think of who, who would carry something like that. Um, there's a movie, <coughs> uh, The Born Identity. There's a there's a part in that movie where he's at a diner with with another individual, right? And so they're having a casual conversation, and then that comes up the situation or his part. He predicted that well, he didn't necessarily predict. He knew, knew that there were you know 15 people at this diner, and that it was X amount of steps to get from the diner to this 18 wheeler. That he assumed there would be a gun in there. You know, he did all that prediction while he was just here having a normal conversation. You know? And he didn't know how he was doing all that. Right? But his body had been conditioned to that. Just like, <clears throat> I live here in the city of Mesquite. I love this city, I love this town. Like I said, I moved here from, from out of town to, to be here, and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in patrolling the city that you live and work in. Right? And so, so I, I'll stay here. Um, but, don't tell my bosses, but I leave a couple minutes late or early um, on the same day of the week. I don't want to give anybody the idea or even my neighbors know that, hey, this guy has a pattern. He, he leaves here 8 o'clock in the morning every morning without fail. Right? Sometimes I leave at 7.50, sometimes I leave at 6 in the morning, sometimes I leave at 8.20, you know. And then so if my boss is like, hey, you're late, but hey, hey, easy now. Situational awareness, all right? I want people to know my moves. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> you never know who could be watching you. Like I, think, I always think about it like this. Every gun I ever come in contact is going to be loaded. Right? Every camera that I see is going to be on. Right? And that's how I live my life. I know if there's any, any gun I'm going to come in contact with, it's going to be loaded. Any camera I'm going to be coming in contact with is always on. Right? So I conduct myself like that. Um, so I, like I said, now I gave you my, my secret about my... My patterns. Where you live? <laughs> <laughs> I literally live like two seconds from right here. Your 1041 is immediately when you get in your car, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's how you know, here's the thing. If anything were to happen to the church, you'd be lucky because I'm literally like a hop, skip, and jump away from here. So if anything happened, I'd be right here. 
Yes, yeah, we yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, I, what's that? You always prepared. You gotta get dressed. You know. You know the cool thing is with Super Speed, I get to bring my own squad car home. So I have all my vests in there. I have my heavy vests. I'm a hostage negotiator as well. So I keep my rifle, my vest, everything. I'm ready to rock and roll at any time. Um, maybe that's why I'm a hostage negotiator because they call me at odd hours of the night to come and assist. Let me tell you a story real quick. Um, and one time at three o'clock in the morning, I get a call from the police department. And they say, hey, Officer Couturis, um, there's a guy on the bridge and he wants to talk to you. <laughs> I know, I was like, wow, we're doing that now? We're special requesting officers. He said he wants to talk to you before he jumps off the bridge. Before he does. Before. Well, then don't go. Before he jumps. Right? <laughs> if you don't go, you won't jump. I'm done. <laughs> so my first thoughts were, how does this guy know I'm a hostage negotiator? You know, that's pretty interesting. And his bad, my second thought is, it's bad luck that I'm a hostage negotiator. Because right? he's not going to do, hopefully, you know, jump off the bridge. So. What's that? Somebody you knew. There we go. So I throw all my gear on, I get dressed and everything, and I go over there, you know, all groggy, 3 o'clock in the morning, because, you know, the people don't want to kill themselves during normal business hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I get all my gear on, I get up to the bridge, and as I'm walking up the bridge, it was my next door neighbor. You know, I moved up here from when I was a kid in that neighborhood. Um, you know, the funny thing is that neighborhood when I first moved there was completely Caucasian. There was no Hispanics, no African Americans, nobody but us. So my dad, like I said, from Poti, my mother is first generation um, Mexican American. Well, she's Mexican and, and came over here. So we were the only Hispanics on that block. And so like any Hispanic historically, my mother brought her family, which is us, and then her family, there's all 20 of them, they all live in that house. But the funny thing is you go back to that neighborhood and it's literally all Hispanics, like it's completely changed. But what happened with my neighbor here is that he lost his house, he had gone through a really bad spell in this, in this part of his life, and his children wanted, didn't want anything to do with them. I kind of kept a good relationship with him, you know, when he lived there, my parents would go visit him and wave, talk to him, say hi. But um, his mother passed away, began using drugs, he's raising his only children, they grew up and they moved away, one went to prison. And I'll kind of give his whole life story now, but just kind of put you why, why he's on that bridge, right? Um, <clears throat> so he wanted to see me one last time before he gave it all up. And so when I walked up, and, you know, what would you say to somebody like that? Sorry about your bad luck. That's terrible. Hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> so I just pretty so much told him a story. I told him a story. I said, you know what, uh, Mr. White, that was his last name, I never got to thank you for being such a good neighbor. You, know, you always took care of my family, all 15,000 of us in that house. <laughs> You're such a great person. You know, when other people would not like us, you took us in. I never knew what Southern hospital Hospitality was until I actually moved to Mesquite. You know, back in those days, um, they had a screen, you know, this screen door, and they kept the front door open. So, is it your wife? <laughs> <laughs> So back in those days, they just had the regular door and then they had a screen door. The regular door and the front door was open and the screen door was there to let the you know, cool air in. So I go there, knock on the door. He's like, come in. I had never experienced, hey, come on into my house, you know, random kid. And so I got scared and ran away. But that was really nice. You know, Southern hospitality, just come on into my house, here's something to drink, hang out. And so he was such a nice man. And that's why I told him, I said, thank you so much for, for just being a good human being to my family and I. And I'm sorry that it just took this situation for me to tell you that. He said, you know what, I'll do whatever you ask. Mm -hmm. I said, we'll get off that ledge and we'll get some coffee and, and take care of you. And sure enough, he did. He's still alive. That's how I earned this life-saving award. Right here. So, so. I thought it was usually the police just point to the fire haze over there. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> That's how it usually goes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I did have the fire department down there on the highway with that, you know, <laughs> that plane, you know kind of shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Red nose, big shoes. <laughs> they kept tripping over their clown shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, sorry, I'm getting off task. You know, uh, but, uh, I'll try to stay on task. I don't have you here forever. But start by noticing threats that surround you. You know, please expand your awareness to other than non-threatening elements. You know. Obviously, you want to look for people that can 
you know, those things that kind of make your hair stand up in the back or give that gut feeling. I can promise you to always, always, always go with your gut. If you feel something in your gut or that hair, go with that intuition because it's always right. It's always right. And that, that's how I've been able to keep myself alive, especially in police work. It's been going with that gut. Um, I have, in 2008, flipped this police car before. Yeah, I'll tell you that story really quickly. And so in the city of Mesquite, we have to do sex offender checks. He's going to run out of tape. He's like, sorry, we're out. But uh, in the city of Mesquite, we do sex offender checks. And I was at this one house checking. I had the door open. Uh, I, I go in and say, hey, police. My partner comes back me up. Nobody was home. So we're out there just standing on the front yard. And when this car, this, this Jeep, just zooms on by really fast. And my partner had a rookie. And the rookie's like, let's go get him. So we get in our cars. And up the street a little bit, he hits a car and wrecks out and keeps going. All right, so we pass up, we get another unit to come and help this vehicle, and now we're in the back alley. Uh, let me give you kind of orientation points. Um, Bruton and uh, Rodeo Center, there's a street in there called Devlon. Devlon has a back alley driveway, just kind of like Creek Crossing. Um, but those alleys aren't as fancy as Creek Crossing. They're a little old and, you know, from you know, time they start to erode and whatnot, and so there's loose gravel there. <clears throat> As I hit that loose gravel, my old Crown Victoria, <laughs> which was my take-home car, by the way, you know, I told you I lived in the city of Mesquite, started to, to turn a little bit, and as it turned, it got a little off, and there's a telephone pole right there. Oh. I clipped that telephone pole, and it launched me in the air. And so, as I'm in the air, sideways like this, I'm like, not my car. <laughs> I land, and I guess I watched too many movies as a kid, and so the airbag went off and there was a bunch of smoke in here, and I was like, this thing's about to blow! <laughs> <laughs> so I punched the windshield, which I do not recommend. No. Oh. You, the windshield will win before you ever think about winning. So after two good hits, just uh, one hit kind of cracked and everything, and then another hit, and then it got the crack, and I was like, hey, you know, I'm going to probably blow up in this car so before I get this window out. So I just climbed out the top. Obviously, the car didn't blow up. Um, I don't even know where I was going with that story, but I flipped, <laughs> <laughs> I flipped the squad, I flipped the squad car in 2008. Oh, absolutely. So now I did foot patrol for the last three years. <laughs> but, I'm sorry, let me get back to this. I'm distracted with all these millions of stories. But by starting to notice threats surrounding that surround you, expand your awareness to other non-threatening elements, all right? Things that don't necessarily like sitting at a restaurant with my back against the wall. You know, that's not necessarily life-threatening or anything like that, or I'm not looking for bad guys. I just, like I said at the very beginning, you know, this situation of awareness is the currency with which you purchase time to act, right? Well, what's you, funny is when there's a whole bunch of police <laughs> sitting at the same time. And the Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> and they all want the back seat. <laughs> Absolutely true. So, you know, I even find myself doing that at dinner with my family or when we're at a fancy restaurant and the server's like, here you go, sir. I'm like, no, thank you. And I'll sit over here, you know. Yeah, I don't like that either. I don't like sitting my back against the door either. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> basic situational awareness also requires you to notice the locations, conditions, and actions of elements around you. Um, you know, something as simple as just knowing when the place closes, you know, or, or saying, hey, you know, I don't want to be at the state fair during this point in time. Right. You got to think about this too. The chief is really big on data. He wants to be a data-driven organization, and so we have a community crime app that you can log on right now to community crime app on your smartphone, laptop, whatever. Type in community crime app, and you can zoom in on the ski. And you can see all the crime that's happening in an area. So let's say we zoom in on Town East Mall, which gets 14 million visitors a year. Right. Well, under crime app, there's a thing called analytics. In analytics, it shows you. Hey, this is the most prevalent crime in the mall, which would be? Shoplifting. There you go, shoplifting. But it also breaks it down to day of the week where it's more prevalent and by time. So you're like, you know what, I don't want to go to the mall at this time because this is one where there'll be more congestion and issues, so I'll go at this other time. So that's the same thing, is just being aware of, hey, you know, if I want to see what time is best for me to go to the mall, I know it requires situational work. Awareness does require some work on our end. You know, to do this, to to even do simple things, sit behind our back, keep our head up, you know, walk. Like, um, 
you know, walk when we're in an uncertain situation with our head up and our chest held high, you know, where we know we're going to be, so we won't get taken advantage of, right? Um, when we're keeping our purses close to us when we're walking from the grocery store, not taking a suitcase, you know, because we're not moving to Walmart, we're just going to buy a couple things. <laughs> <laughs> you get know, that on the camera, <laughs> Don't put it on the back of your chair. <laughs> well, and like I said earlier, always, always, always trust your feelings, right? Trust your feelings, trust your gut. For example, um, if I'm a regular citizen, my wife's like, hey, I'm going to go to the store. I was like, all right. And let's say it's, I don't know, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I don't want her to go to 7 Eleven during that time because what could happen during those times? Something bad, right? She could rob. Exactly, exactly. Or when businesses are going to close, you know. Um, Dollar Generals are infamous for that. Right before they close, people like to go in there and, and rob them, right, as they're closing. So always think about that before business closes. Maybe I shouldn't go in there. I can wait till tomorrow. I don't absolutely need it right then and there. All right. A lot of this thing, too, is um, I say down here to get your mind right. In police work, we, we do the exact same thing. We go in before a shift. It's called a squad meeting. We meet, we cuss, and discuss. We, there we actually do cuss. <laughs> um, we cuss and discuss, talk about things that are going on for the day, talk about bolos, which should be on the lookouts, you know, anything we need to do. And then they, they always tell us to get your mind right because when we're out there on the streets by ourselves and we're thinking about, you know, I sure did get into a big argument with my wife, you know, and I'm so angry I can't, you know, I see red. Um, we always tell, or hey, you know, I just broke up with my girlfriend, or I just, you know, I'm going through this issue. Um, that's not good. That's not good. You can't. We do not want our police officers out there with their minds not right. Just like in the military, you know, you always said check yourself, check your mind before you get out and get ready to go to combat. Because you have to be focused at the task at hand. And so that's kind of the same thing as, as, as trusting your feelings and getting your mind right. You know, focus on what you're doing. Um, if you're a church security member, focus on that. Of course, the pastor saying some wonderful things, and I'm sure we all need it, but. You know, your primary job is to protect the flock, right? And you can't do that if you're sitting somewhere else away from the main entrances, all right? So just think about that. When you're here at church, get your mind, mind right. Focus on what you have to do as far as security for the team if you're wearing one of these beautiful shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Limit situational overload, all right? Where would you find situational overload? Like maybe Tech So You Weekend at the State Fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there a million like there, yeah. Or are they in front of you, Grambling game? <coughs> oh, yeah. You know? Okay. Limit those interactions, all right? They cause high stress and increased errors, especially if you're moving way too fast. All right? Take your time, slow down. We always teach you officers that slow is fast, all right? Especially when it comes to, to firearms training. Um, obviously, you saw. Um, the Fort Worth incident, right? Four seconds. Let me see your hands and then shoot. Uh, yeah, definitely not. Definitely not. So take your time. Take your time. Don't move too fast. All right. Prioritizing, delegating tasks, and minimizing surrounding stress can improve travel during times of overload, right? If you're stressed, let's say there's something that's a natural disaster that's happening here <coughs> at the church, right? There's a huge tornado out there, right? You're going to delegate your task. Hey, you're going to go lock this door on the east side. You're going to go to the west side and take care of this situation over here. You're going to get these people and corral them here, make sure they don't leave here. You go take care of the nursery. You know, don't put everything, Mr. Lord, I got it all. I'll take care of it. You guys just hunker down. I'll take care of this. Exactly. Definitely don't do that. Exactly. Exactly. And the enemy of us all, complacency. We all get lax. We all get lazy. Right? We, we forget to do things sometimes, like turn on our porch lights. Right? And then lighting, although it's not a physical barrier, it is a psychological barrier. Right? Or, you know, there's a button on your fob here that will lock your car door. <laughs> <laughs> if you press this button, it will lock that car. You know, so you can place it. You know, I was reading something on social media where somebody put, somebody broke into my vehicle. Uh, I can't believe it. And another post person, you know, because everything on the internet is true. Right? <laughs> so somebody else posted, did you, did you lock your car and secure your, you know, remove your belongings? The other person said, 
No, but this never happened to me before. What? That's why. That's the first thing. You're absolutely right. There you go. You get that on ring. Absolutely. So avoid complacency. You know what? Lock your car doors. The hard part is that now people out of 60% of the crimes that happen in Mesquite are, are burglary motor vehicles. 40% of those are unlocked cars. Mm -hmm. now we could eliminate that whole aspect if you just lock your car door or remove things that people would be interested in getting. You know, nowadays what they call car hopping is these young kiddos walking around just checking door handles. That's all they do, just check door handles. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right, folks, well, sweet. Let me open this door handle. Ooh, there's some loose change. Collect change. If you go to your website and go to Reddit and type in car hopping, there's literally a whole subreddit on there on what to do and how to do it. Wear dark clothing. It tells, it tells in the article to kids. Wear dark co clothing. Work in partners. Take change but put it in a sock so you limit the noise because you won't be jingling around in there when you walk in the neighborhood. Right? It tells you all those things in there. You know? And those people are paying attention. I, I can tell you, they're not complacent. Right? That's, our, that's our street. Yeah. That's our street. They do that a lot. Well, leave cars on the lot? I my head in my car. Well, they just, you know, the change is gone, but nothing, you know, it's just, and they, they, they take everything out of the box, box. They just, you know, there's, there's two different types of people that do that stuff. There's some that like leave it pristine that way nobody knows they were in there, right? But take the important things. And there's some people that just toss it because they have no time, right? Or, you know, the hard part is when they do that, they leave the door unlocked, they become complacent. But they're, you know what? I'm not going to take my gun in either. I'm going to leave it in the car. Mm. <laughs> now we got a 17 year old with a firearm. <coughs> right. So avoid complacency at all times. All right. Make it a habit. Make, make situational awareness a habit. Was I complacent when I was sitting there texting in my squad car with the red light? Yeah. My, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, I'm not you know, trying to say, hey, you guys need to be like me. I'm human too. We all make mistakes. We all get complacent. We need to work on that. All right. Be aware of your time. Right. When you when you were a kid, right? When you were out playing, your parents always wanted you to be home when ten o'clock. When the lights came on, right? <laughs> or ten o'clock when the lights came on, right? Be aware of time. Be aware of time, and and uh, that it can be your friend or your enemy at times as well. Okay. <clears throat> like if I go out of town and I had this, if I had to come to this event at twelve o'clock, I'm not going to leave San Antonio at uh, you know eight o'clock in the morning to try to get here because I'm kind of too close. Right? You know, you time. The good thing now is that our fancy little phones there have a map, and you hit that little map button and you route it, it'll tell you an approximate time when you're going to get there. You know where you're when unplanned events begin to arise, be sure to make the necessary changes to your schedule and goals to help yourself. I don't want you guys to think that situational awareness is only, you know, always being at the ready as far as your safety and security with your firearm or anything like that. It's your everyday life. It's everything, you know. It's even being at work, you know, planning your schedule, coordinating things, delegating work to somebody else to make it easier for yourself, your work environment, and your just life in general with your family. Okay. Begin to evaluate and understand situations. All right, understand multiple elements through the process of pattern recognition, interpretation, and evaluation. All right, use the information to determine how to your goals or in the case of your ultimate survival, right? Like camping, right? We all like going out and doing camping. Is it going to be very effective when you don't have a tent? <laughs> or you don't have the necessary tools to build a fire? Or the cooking stuff that you need to do with that? Thing? This will help you build a comprehensive picture of your immediate surroundings and a better understanding of situational awareness. So just evaluate and understand different types of situations that are, are going to be going on. Um, in your li everyday life. This is a very important one. Uh, actively pr prevent fatigue because we all get tired, we all get sleepy, right? We all work too much. You know, they had, at the police department, there were officers working so much overtime that they had to give us a rule. You know, police officers have a ton of rules for everything because, you know what, there's a name tied to that. Somebody screwed something up, and so there's a general order as to why you can't do that, right? Like, we have to wear seat belts and police cars and high-speed chases because if you flip a car and we're not wearing a seatbelt, mm -hmm. you can't wear a seatbelt. Very true. I was always, uh, I thought uh, y'all not supposed to wear seatbelts all the time because if y'all need to get out, you know, in an emergency, you know, for ch chases, y'all can't, you know. 
going back to you know situational awareness, we don't want to move too fast because that's when we start making mistakes. You know? And so you know, we train ourselves that if let's say we're going to get out on a suspect, right? You already plan to have your seatbelt and take it off then. Don't take it off beforehand. Let's say you, you flip a squat part. Well, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. well, we did the same thing in fire department. We got to where we have to get bumped out before we get in the engine to leave the station. Back in the day, we just grab, jump in the engine and we'd get dressed in route. And I was even on the old engine where I didn't have a door between me and the outside of the road going down the road. And I'm there hopping around putting on my gear. Or on the side running board and <laughs> hit a bump, fast turn, I don't know what's coming. Mm -hmm. and so they slowed us down too a little bit to be safer in the long run. Let me give you another story with the police and fire department and how the, the, the fire department I've noticed is very methodical in what they do. There's a reason why they slow down and work, whereas police officers are like <coughs> bulls in the china shop. Right? For example, um, you guys all remember that lost in bus crash? where that girl was on fire. Yeah. Well, police officers went in there and were trying to get her out. This car, this bus was catching on fire. I mean, it was a huge deal. The fire department got there. They slowed down. And the fire the officer was like, no, what are you doing? Let's go. We better do this. Well, there was power lines on that bus. Uh -huh. And if an officer was not careful, he would get electrocuted. We did not know that. But guess who did? The fire department. Right? And they're aware of those things. And that's why they slowed down. So they're not only trying to take care of themselves, but the situation at hand. So always, always, always slow down. Don't move too fast, especially when it comes to a firearm. You know, uh, police officers, we have to be accurate. You know, let's say we do pull out our firearm and shoot, and we shoot past our intended target and hit little Sally that's down the street. You know? So another thing going into situation awareness is actively preventing fatigue. Get that rest. Get that necessary rest to make sure you're not groggy. Uh, we get calls all the time on 18-wheelers driving erratic on the highway, and we pull them over, and it's because the 18-wheeler driver's fatigued. He hasn't got enough sleep. He hasn't got enough rest. Not that he's drunk or anything. I always hope not. But he can get any rest, and so you make mistakes when you're, you're not actively aware or you're awake. Okay. All right. Continually assess the situation. The changes, the situation is constantly ever-evolving. Like it, it, a crisis incident here at the church. It's always changing, right? Something's going to be different. You could have an incident just unfold. You guys are here trying to take care of it, and then here comes the media showing up. I want to interview, sir, what happened? After you just got involved with a catastrophic incident here, you just watched a loved one pass away. Sir, can you tell me how you feel? What's going on? You need to have somebody say, hey, you know what, come with me, me and we're going to stage you right here, right? It's always, the situation is constantly changing. You guys have to adapt to that, okay? Monitor performance of others, right? If somebody in your security team is kind of slacking, right, not showing up to your meetings, hey, guys, we're going to go uh, do this. Those that have a handgun license, we're going to go to this, um, we're going to go to this gun range and practice shooting, you know, we're going to do that together as a team. Ah, so Sorry, I can't make it that week. You know, I gotta watch the Cowboys. Or hey, I got, uh, you know, I got some stuff to go do. You know, we were talking about that. Participate, participate in your in your security team and give it all you got. You know, step down. Right. A weak link in your family could be the difference between success or failure in your survival. Right? That kind of that reminds me right there of like a. Zombie apocalypse or something like that. <laughs> we got poor Uncle Joe here's broken leg. Ah, he's kind of weighing us down when we're sleeping. <laughs> Don't do that. No, that's, that's, that's harsh. It's a deal. Right here, when changes are needed, take action. Right? Sometimes it doesn't help. You're on a security team together as a group. Work together as a group. That's why you're here. You gotta think. You gotta think big picture as far. The security team is here, but the big picture is the safety and security of everyone in that church, all right? Let's say something bad does happen and you lose <clears throat> lives. Who's that fall on? That's a, that's a hard burden to carry, you know? So, so I treat it uh, with the utmost respect as far as being uh, tasked to wear this shirt. Does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, ideas? <coughs> No, what, do you, what do you recommend for um, 
situating people within the church. We, I have some, such as Guy, that's yeah, in the... Uh, yeah, his. but honestly, you know, listen, if I'm up there playing guitar, I'm going to guitar. I'm, I, my mind is yeah. yeah. the, chord, the chord changes and moving around. It, I'm there, I'm aware of what's in between. But when I'm into a song, right, it's not... You know, yeah, I'm not, not there. I have no. him and there's two or three others in the choir. And, you know, then I have persons like this one that sits down front. <laughs> and, you know... This one too. <laughs> but anyway, you know, what do you, I, I don't see anything wrong with a couple of people being down in the front, you know, kind of a. No, I, I and agree. And I'm in the back, and so is some other. I, I agree. You know, let's say he's up at the front right next to the pastor, and some deranged lunatic comes that hates the pastor and running up to the front, he can stop. Very close to But then again, if he, had, if he carries a firearm, I don't want him shooting over the congregation to the back. Exactly. You know what I mean? And that's kind of your double edged sword effect. Yeah, I think about this too. There's a video where I saw where there is a lady pulling in to her gated entrance to her house, and their car comes sweeping around. You know, get that thing stand up in the back of your neck, the little hairs there. Some don't feel right. You know, you look up, your situation situationally aware. She put that bad boy in reverse and took off, right, before she could take advantage of possibly. Um, just like an incident that happened here in Mesquite at that Hispanic restaurant. They're in the main square, right? This couple finished eating their, they finished eating their uh, dinner. We're sitting in the car just a little too long. Some guy came up to them, tapped them on the window, give me all your money. Right? Mm -hmm. Versus they would have been aware of the situation, looking, monitoring. You know, we'll get on Facebook when we get home. Let's get out of here. Mm -hmm. yeah. What we being aware of surroundings, the biggest thing. Keep your eye on your swivel, especially during the holidays, right? Don't load up your whole car with gifts. Be like, I'll get them in the morning. I'm too tired. They're gonna be gone in the morning. Always. Avoid getting complacent. So, any questions? I don't want to keep you guys here forever. I know you guys gotta go watch your capital. <laughs> Whatever else you guys gotta go do. Any questions, thoughts, ideas? I definitely want to help you with anything and everything possible for the success of this church. Like I said, hopefully this will be all for nothing. That you guys just sit here, stood here and I got to take up an hour of your day for no reason. But you know, we're putting those deposits in the bank. Right? That way you think. And Miss Creech is out there by herself at Walmart and like. Let me look around before I head to my car. You should at least take, try to take advantage of me. Or another thing that we have happening a lot is people go to the bank, go in there and withdraw their money. Well, there are bad guys in the car that are watching you do this. Here's the thing, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but bad guys don't take a day off. So they're sitting in that car watching you make that $5,000 withdrawal so you can go buy a new car, right? Follow you to, I'm going to stop and get a bite to eat at you know, restaurants. Some of you're in TGI Fridays enjoying the endless apps. Somebody goes in there, breaks in your car, and takes your five thousand dollars. That happened to the owner of Sports City. He went to the bank, withdrew ten thousand dollars, went to the other business. He put it in the trunk. They were sitting in the parking lot. Like I said, the bad guys don't take a day off. Break in that window, hop in the back seat, get that ten thousand dollars, and now those bad guys ten thousand dollars richer, and that guy just got taken advantage of. Right? People are watching you. Just like I said, guns always loaded, the cameras always on. Right. People are always constantly watching. Yes, sir. Yeah, because I always be, be wary of, of churches like, you know, mm -hmm. about, you know, we still have open doors and all for guests and visitors and stuff. And I just remember this one incident where this guy uh, came in and he, he robbed the church. I mean, you know, like you were saying, be aware of your, you know, and, you know, and then, you know, they know when the offering is going to be and mm -hmm. they know, you know, and I always be leery about, you know, open doors. At the churches, I know we're supposed to be like that. So I'm always curious about how can you, I know it's hard to detect. I, I think the thing about a church is that we all come in here with the perception of thinking this is a safe and holy place. In reality, if you think about it, it's not a hotel for saints, it's a hospital for sinners. You know, yeah. Think about it like that. So there are people that are going to come in from the outside that you've never seen before in your whole life. And you don't know what their background is, their intentions, absolutely. To rob the church or or sexually assault a youth member, you know, you don't know what their intentions are. So, so yes, this is a warm. Hey, brother, glad to see you. I'm glad you're here. Good to take care of yourself. You know, have a good day. Those are all fine and dandy. But um, let me remind you that we have arrested several people from churches here in the city of Mesquite. Okay, so do not get complacent. Okay? Always keep your house filled, especially if you're on the security team. I cannot stress that enough. Questions?
There's more pizza back there? Uh, for you. <laughs> so, like I said, I don't want to keep you here too long. Thank you so much for having me. If there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're interested in the CPA, um, we start every uh, we start up in September and we graduate in September.